In really a most unique way, the Torah tells us in great detail about Moshe's birth and his development as a leader of the Jewish people. And one of the most significant moments of that story takes place at the very beginning of our Parsha. Bat Paro, the daughter of Pharaoh, she sees a baby floating in the Nile River and chooses to name him Moshe Kimin Hamayim Mishitihu because she draws him forth from the water. And if you think about it, it's really a remarkable moment. Bad Paro sees a child in danger and reaches out to save his life. And if you think about it, there's actually a very similar story to our story from our Parsha of another daughter of Pharaoh and another small child who confronts certain death. And that's the story of Hagar, the maidservant of Sarah, and our son Yishmael. And if you remember Hagar and Ishmael, they were thrown out of the home of Avram. They stray into the wilderness and out of water, not wanting to watch the death of her son. Hagar leaves Ishmael off by the shrubs. And in that moment, miraculously, God hears the voice of the child and helps to open the eyes of Hagar to find a well of water to quench the thirst of Ishmael. But what's remarkable about these two stories are really the similarities the similarities in the story of Hagar and Ishmael on the one hand, and the story of Bat Paro and Moshe on the other. You see, in both stories, the principal actress is actually an Egyptian woman. In fact, Rashi quotes the Medrash and tells us that Hagar is also a Bat Paro, a daughter of Pharaoh. In both stories, we find a child whose life is threatened by water. In the case of Ishmael, it's in the desert. He's going to die because he's going to die of lack of thirst from water. In the case of Moshe, the only thing separating him from drowning in the Nile is simply a wicker basket. And in both stories, crying figures prominently. It's the cry of Yishmael that evokes God's response, and it's the cry of Moshe that elicits Bat Paro's compassion. And in truth, there are so many more similarities, from the use of specific words and language in the psukim and the verses, to even how each one of these women choose to act. And yet, for all of the similarities between these two narratives, there remains one fundamental distinction, and that is how each character responds in their respective moment of crisis. And as I've shared with you previously, Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch famously describes how Hagar's response is morally objectionable. Not being able to bear the pain of her son, she casts him off and moves to a distance out of earshot. Yet where is her empathy? Where are the comforting words, the warm embrace of a mother being present for her ailing son? And yet, think for a moment to Bat Paro. In all likelihood, if she does absolutely nothing, then this baby is going to die. And despite the fact that the baby is not hers, the Torah tells us, Vatachmol alav, she takes pity on this child and adopts him and sees to it that this baby is cared for. And the Midrash comments on these psukim that one who becomes a surrogate parent to a child that is not their own is actually considered to have sired that child. In fact, the word Moshe in ancient Egyptian actually means son. And as the Nitziv of Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin explains, this is really what Bat Paro means when she declares, Kimin Hamayim Mishitihu, that I saved him. I drew him out of the water. I, she says, am the reason that he's alive. He's mine. Hence the name Moshe because he's now my son. And perhaps we can suggest that the Torah here is purposely recording the exact same story in the exact same way in our Parsha to highlight how differently Bat Paro acts in the same circumstances compared to Hagar. By replaying that old story of Hagar and providing a different ending, the Torah is making a critical argument about what it means to be a mother or a father. Because you see, in truth, there are really two types of parenthood. There's biological parenthood, and there's what we might call voluntary parenthood, which includes anyone who takes an active role in shaping and bettering the life of any child, whether or not that child shares any genetic connection with you. What we learn from our Parsha is that success in this realm, it's not measured in biological terms. We see that in the parental failure of Hagar, who is Ishmael's biological mother but rather Bat Paro, who was a parent by choice, through one courageous and compassionate act, changed the history of the entire world. And what I think the Torah here is trying to teach us is that each and every one of us has a responsibility, whether biological or not,
to be like Bat Paro and not only care for others, but to put the needs of the next generation front and center, to think about the children, to think about the future. It means thinking about what we're doing to actively demonstrate our commitment and support to that future. And while that obviously includes things like prioritizing and supporting Jewish education in all forms, it also includes seriously thinking more about how we act and what behaviors we model for our children so that they can have a better and brighter future than us. In a time where the world is filled with more division, more conflict, more vitriol, more hate, we need to realize that our children are watching us and they are listening carefully. They're watching how we act and they see and they hear what we do and sadly what we don't do when our morals and our ethics demand better. We need to realize and think about how our actions and our words are affecting not only ourselves, but more importantly, our future, our children. And while this was a dark week for us in the United States, I do believe that our future is bright. All of us should be like Bat Paro and recognize that the future is literally in our hands, that we need to cherish and we need to care for it as the potential for our greatest dreams and aspirations lives on through our children. Shabbat Shalom.